Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Well, howdy! Great to see you guys. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, If you have a Bible, we are in Philippians chapter 1, and uh, I want to read to you a couple verses, uh, starting in verse 12. Uh, we'll pray and then jump into them. So uh, Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Uh, I'll read. And and it says this. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as is my eager expectation and hope that I'll not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, thank you for these few minutes around your word together. I just want to thank you that we're here, whether... We've come passionate about linking up with you, God, because we love to celebrate you, or or whether that's not us at all. There's a host of reasons that could have drawn us here. But wherever we are in life and in our understanding of who you are and what you're like, I just thank you for a few minutes to think about why we're here, what all this is for. And I just pray, God, as as we think about why you made us, I just pray that you would clear our minds of distraction. We could focus in on that big question of why and focus in on what you're doing. And and I pray, God, it would affect our lives. I pray for a shift in how we see our days as a result of these minutes together. And I I know I can't create that. So we're asking you, God, will you make this moment bigger than any of us could on our own? And I want to invite you, if you're willing, to take a second and pray and ask him. Say, God, please teach me something this morning. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Apple launched the iPhone 6 a few weeks ago. And within three weeks of its launch, there's 21 million in circulation being used. So they're feeling good. Uh, And it was interesting to be online when they made the big announcement of the phone and just kind of watch the collective geek technology world lose their minds, right, Uh, when the latest Apple product came out. And even now, you see all these tech reviews on it that are thrilled. You see commercials uh, from Apple just extolling all the benefits of this new device. And yet what I've seen is in all the advertisements about it, all the commentary on it, nobody has said, man, the iPhone 6 is really amazing 
at holding doors open. If you just look at its slick design, it fits cleanly under a door. They are revolutionizing door opening technology. You don't see that anywhere. You didn't see anyone at the unveiling of the phone go, and notice how evenly it spreads butter on toast. Are you seeing this distribution? <laughs> Unreal, right? They didn't do it. Why? Because they know, and they know that we know, that's not what an iPhone's for. And they know that an iPhone's going to achieve its highest potential and create its greatest satisfaction when it's used in accordance with its design. And so you could use it for those other things, but that's a waste of it. They understand if you want to reach its highest potential and you want your greatest satisfaction, then use it in accordance with created intent. That's where you're going to get the greatest joy out of the product, right? And the interesting thing is that's not just true of a phone. That's true of anything in life. To see the highest potential reached in anything and for it to experience the greatest satisfaction in life, it is to fulfill its created intent, to be used for what it's for, how it's designed. See, freedom, true freedom, is not the absence of all limitations. It's not. Freedom is the liberty to pursue the design and intent for which you were created. So freedom for a fish is to swim because it's created to swim. I'm going to be free to walk on land. That's not freedom. You're designed to swim and a fish is most free when it swims. A bird is most free when it flies because that's how it was made. When it fulfills its created intent, that's when it reaches its highest potential. That's where it experiences its greatest satisfaction, when it fulfills its created design. Do you see it? Now, I say that to you, and I, I would imagine many of you go, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's okay. I get that. When you use something in accordance with its design, uh, that's when it reaches its potential. That's when we're most satisfied. That's true of a phone. That's true of a fish. That's true of you. The Bible says that now this is eternal life, that you would know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That for you to really experience life, you're meant to pursue it as you've been made. And that is to know God, to love God, to link up with his purposes of why he made you. That's where you experience your greatest potential as a man. That's where you find your greatest satisfaction as a woman, as a child, mom, dad. When I pursue my creator's design, it's true of everything. And some of you hear that and you go, that makes sense. Pursue my created, created intent. Why? Was I designed? Let me fulfill that design. That's where I'm going to be happiest. Some of us agree with that. But not everybody does. Not everybody thinks this way. It's interesting. A couple years ago, Life Magazine, a couple years ago, Life Magazine doesn't exist anymore. Um, more like the 80s. Uh, Life Magazine uh, did uh, one of their uh, whole, uh, I don't know, magazines on um, the meaning of life. Like, what's the purpose in life? And I quote it here because they come up with basically two general categories that are still the categories today. And it's interesting, they ask that question of people, like, why? Why are we here? Which is a great question. I remember I used to have a boss that used to say, everyone will tell you what they do, but not many people know the why, why you do what you do. And it's a good question. Why are we here? What are we living for? What's the purpose of your existence here. Make a little money to buy a few things, to be comfortable, then die? What was the point? What's the point of all of this? It's an interesting question. If I told you, hey, meet me at Starbucks at two, many of you would say, why? <laughs> you would want to know the purpose. If I'm going to dedicate an hour to you, for what reason? Yet when I ask the big why of why anything, why everything, why do you even get up in the morning? Many of us don't have the answer to that. And so Life Magazine asks, why? Why are we here? And you get answers that tend to break along two lines. You get guys like Jose Martinez, a taxi driver, that says, we're here to die. Just live and die. I drive a cab. I do some fishing, take my girl out, pay taxes, do a little reading. Then you drop dead. You're rich, you're poor, you're here, you're gone. You're like the wind. And after you're gone, other people come. We're going to destroy ourselves. And there's nothing we can do about it. So there's chipper little nuggets like that in this article. <laughs> and then on the other side, you have people like Garrison Keillor. Some of you listen to Garrison Keillor on NPR. And Garrison Keillor said, uh, we exist to know God. 
and to serve God. He said, that's why we're here. Mike Ditka was asked. And he said, I believe we're here for a reason. We're created by somebody, to live for somebody, and to return to somebody. I believe I'm created by God to do the job he's given me while I'm here, to serve him, then return to him. That's what Mike Ditka said. Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist, said this of the human race. Our appearance looks more like an accidental afterthought than the culmination of a prefigured plan. We're here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. We're here because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age. We're here because a small tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. This explanation, though superficially troubling, is not terrifying, is ultimately liberating and exhilarating. We cannot read the meaning of life passively in the facts of nature. We must construct these answers ourselves for our own wisdom and ethical sense. There is no other way. And so what's interesting is when you read this article, it breaks along lines that most people break today. You got two options. I either believe there's a God and he created me and there's a purpose to that and I embrace his created intent to fulfill the design that he made me for, believing that that will help me reach my highest potential and my greatest satisfaction in life. I embrace a God-given plan for my life. Or I say there is no God. And so there's no design. There's no purpose. There's no reason at all. There's no higher reason for why you exist. You're just an accident. And so you create your own meaning. Or for some people, they'll say there is a God, but we can't know what his will is. So if he has a purpose or intent for us, we can't know it anyway, but it functionally lands you in the same place. Rather than embracing a God-given design, believing that he designed me for a purpose that as I fulfill it, I find satisfaction, or other people say, no, there's no purpose to embrace. I create my own. There's no why for you're here. So just figure out what makes you happy and do that until you become dust. That's the option. I pursue and embrace a God-given design or I create my own out of just whatever I think will make me happy, right? That's the idea. Now, for the rest of our time together, we we could sort of debate these two major philosophies that all of us in this room are living out of, whether you believe in a God or not. Are you pursuing his design or creating your own purpose for your life? We could debate this philosophically, and that would be a great use of our time, but we're not going to do it. What I want to do is take these two philosophies and drop them down onto the street, Let's put them in real world and see how do they react to real world circumstances, namely five areas. Changing circumstances of life, the success of other people, the weight of your own desires, the well-being of society, and the inevitability of death. When you approach those five things that will be a part of our life, if I'm pursuing these paths, how do they react to those inevitable realities? And we'll do it by looking at the life of Paul in Philippians because Paul in this moment, I don't know if you saw him, Paul's ecstatic because he's found a God-given purpose for his life and it thrills his soul. And we'll contrast Paul's experience with the experience of those who would say, there is no God-given purpose to embrace. I create my own. So as we look at them, let's look at the first thing. One, how do these two paths, if I walk either one and all of us are, how do they react to the changing circumstances of life? If you create your own purposes, then they can be taken away by any change of circumstance. If you say, I'm just here to figure out whatever makes me happy and do that, there's no design to pursue, I create my own purpose in life, if that's you, then you need to know that you are subject to all the different winds of chance, that a series of unfortunate events can rob you of your very meaning and purpose for existing. We see this all the time. You see it in athletes that they say, my whole life is success on the athletic field. That's where I get all my value as a person. All my desires are met. That's what my meaning is, success on the athletic field. If that's your purpose, it can be taken away in a second by injury or by age. If your whole purpose is to fulfill your life out on that field, a knee blows out and your purpose is gone. Or you turn 35. (laughs) And it's over. 
And you see a lot of athletes can't handle that. And you see a lot of alcohol abuse and a lot of drug abuse. Or you see people try to hang in the game way too long and it gets sad. Why? Because that's all I've got. And when circumstances change, the circumstances don't just change. It robs me of my purpose for living. You see it happen with people with money. That they say, I'm just here to accrue wealth, to build my little kingdom, and he who dies with the most toys wins. And that's my deal. Well, you just got to know, man, every shift of the market threatens your reason for existence. And that's why it wasn't too long ago in our past when America had a big financial crisis, you saw people taking their own lives in this town, people killing themselves because I lost my money. And so when I lost that, I lost me. I lost my reason for even existing. Shia LaBeouf has had a rough year of making some crazy decisions. And I saw him in an interview recently, and he said, I came from uh, a, an abandonment. And he said, so my whole life was a search for acceptance for people to approve of me. And I found through acting, I could get the approval of the crowd. And that was my whole life. And he hit some difficult patches in his acting career. The crowd began to turn on him and he didn't know how to handle it. So he's buried himself in whiskey. And you see for him, he pursued the adulation and applause of the crowd. And when you lose it, he lost himself, lost himself. What is the thing that if I took it from you right now, if you lost it, you would say, I just lost me. You took me, my identity, my reason for living. Is it your beauty? Is it your money? Is it who knows you? If you make your source in life a thing, if I create my own purpose and it's that, you just need to know you have made yourself subject to all the winds of chance, right? Because you are taking finite things and making them ultimate things. That's a tenuous place to be. But on the other side, if you embrace a God-given purpose for your life, then it's unshakable no matter what the circumstances. You see it in Paul. Paul's existence was to proclaim the message of Jesus everywhere. I am traveling all over the known world to make the name of Jesus great. And he starts this letter by telling him, I want you to know that what's happened to me has turned to advance the gospel. What happened to Paul? He got imprisoned. He's thrown in jail. You think if you're gonna depress Paul, that's what you do. He said, if my whole life is traveling the known world to make the name of Jesus great, you think being locked down, he would go, I've lost my reason for living. I don't know what's going on here. You don't see that in Paul. You see him say, hey, they locked me up, but I want you to know it served to advance the gospel because he put me in there and I'm like, okay, prison ministry. I started sharing the gospel with the guards and with everybody else and he just keeps rolling and he doesn't seem upset. Why? Why does this change of circumstances not steal Paul's joy? Because he knows I have embraced a God-given purpose for my life and my God runs the game. He who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it, right? That I know that he works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. When I embrace a God-given plan for my life, I know my God runs everything. So when circumstances change, I'm not thrown off because he runs all of it and his purposes are unshakable and will finish for my good. So I can function with that confidence no matter what happens in the circumstances around me. We saw it at Breakaway. When I became director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station, Texas, one of the most trying things, the, the most difficult thing that ever happened to me is we rent facilities to do our Bible study on the campus of A&M, and early in my ministry there, they tripled the rent of what it cost to, to pay for the venues, and we didn't have any money. So I remember sitting in that meeting when he told me that, and I just went numb. And I remember I told him, you just killed us. You killed us. And I walked out like, I don't, I don't know what just happened. I don't know what's gonna happen. It was a devastating moment for us in ministry. And yet something interesting did happen completely outside of any work I had done, all of a sudden, all these people that are really plugged into A&M and love Jesus heard about us. Not in spite of the tripling of our rent, but because of it. And so many of them were coming out at us and going, wait a second, y'all pay rent? We're like, yeah, and we showed them, they're like, you pay what? Right, and they couldn't believe it. 
And so all of a sudden, all these people started rallying to our cause and started calling up the university and connecting with people. And all of a sudden, I went from the guy in flip-flops hanging out with students to in a tie in the president's office in a box seat at the 50-yard line, shaking hands with people whose names are on be- meet, uh, buildings. And I'm like, what am I doing here? And I'm suddenly mixing in with all these people at all these levels of influence. The university didn't change its policy, but more and more people began to come around and those people began to give to us to order to offset the cost and our uh, giving went way up until a couple years ago, the university dropped our rent back down and they dropped it back down and yet when they were done, all of a sudden, I am suddenly connected at all these levels of the university where you've had massive influence of praying for people in leadership, of building relationships with people who are major influences and we have more money than we've ever had. And so I look at this moment, I go, what's the worst thing that ever happened to me at Breakaway? The tripling of our rent. What's the best thing that's ever happened while I've been leader of Breakaway? The tripling of our rent. (laughs) It was the absolute best thing. So I can't worry about it. I can't get stressed about stuff like that. We had a venue lined up the other day and it got canceled last minute, blew up plans that we had done for months. And people were like, are you devastated? And I'm like, no, because I can't control it. And I don't have to worry about that. How did I become director of Breakaway? Because I was lonely as a sophomore in college and I was eating lunch by myself and a guy came and sat by me because he felt bad for me and he turned out being the director of Breakaway. We started up a friendship that years later he called me and asked me to take over when he left. And so how did I become director of Breakaway and have the influence I have? Because God made me lonely as a sophomore. (laughs) So I can't worry about it. And I don't worry about it. Dothan shows up two times in the Bible. Dothan. Dothan shows up because that's where Joseph in the book of Genesis is sold into slavery by his brothers and God doesn't stop him. Devastating moment. Can't even imagine that. God lets him go. Slave in Egypt. It shows up later when enemy armies attack the city of Dothan and the people beg Elijah, will you do something? And Elijah prays and God moves powerfully to rescue the city of Dothan from their enemies. And you look at that moment, you go, we've only got two Dothans. One where God intervenes powerfully and one where God appears to do nothing. Appears to do nothing. But if you know the story of Joseph, what happens? He's sent to Egypt as a slave. Rises in influence in Egypt. He becomes second in command of all of Egypt. Right around the time a famine hits. And yet he has the leadership and the godly guidance to help them put their house in order so that Egypt survives in the midst of famine. And so do the chosen people of God through whom will come the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so you look at that and you go, God was just as powerfully at work in the dramatic rescue of the people of Dothan and in his complete silence when Joseph was carried away. Both were under the sovereign care of God, leading according to his purposes. So when I embrace his purposes for my life, circumstances, whether good or bad, don't shake me. And so Paul says, they put me in prison, prison ministry, let's go. And it doesn't throw him off. You get a stability when I embrace his plans. We gotta go a lot faster. Okay, number two. Success of other people. If I create my own purposes, then I can be insecure at the success of other people. Because if I've built my whole life on my ability to succeed in a given thing, then anyone else who's good at that thing is a threat. I listened to interviews the other day, completely independent of each other, just for fun. One was with Mike Myers, a successful actor. One was David Letterman, and one was Eminem. And all three of them told a story of seeing someone do what they do better than they could. And they all describe the moment of watching someone do what they do better than they can and how it sent them into a deep spiral of depression because they had built their whole significance on a thing they could do. They created that purpose for themselves. And when someone else could do it better, they lost all their hope because they lost themselves, right? And that happens. Some of you are like that. Your whole life is built on your ability to succeed at work. And so if some guy comes over with a similar skill set, similar personality, but a little more momentum, you can't celebrate him. You hate that guy. You're like, how do I take him out, right? (laughs) You love being the cute one and some girl comes along that's cuter than her. What happens in you? What happens? You just got to start destroying her credibility to other people. You're like, yeah, but she is a horrible person, right? Uh, She beats children, right? You just gotta, you gotta cut her legs out, right? I was talking to college students about that. I said, some of you are in selective organizations where someone has tried to get in and you have purposefully tried to keep them from it. Not because they don't meet the criteria of the group, but because they're too similar to you. They're like you (laughs) 2.0. 
And you're like, I can't handle it. I can't, I got to take them out early. They'll get me off the throne. And a lot of us feel that way, right? And the reality is if someone else succeeds at what we're good at, they terrify us. They're a threat. But if I embrace a God-given purpose for my life, God controls my life. God has a purpose for me, so I'm not worried about what you do. And if you're pursuing the purpose of God along with me, you're not an enemy, you're a friend. And so Paul tells the story, and I won't reread it all. He says, when I went into prison, people saw me go to prison for the name of Jesus, and so it fired up the brothers. They started preaching. It's like when a guy goes cliff diving and jumps off the cliff. All of a sudden, every other guy's like, well, I, I have to go, right? He said, that's what happened. He said, I was preaching Jesus till they imprisoned me, and the other boys saw that, and they said, hey, if he was willing to take a hit, we got to roll, son. And some of them began to preach, and he said, some of them preach because they love me. And they were just like, I'm going to fill in that spot that Paul vacated for the glory of God. And he said, that's awesome. He said, other people started preaching because they saw it as an opportunity to advance themselves. With Paul out of the picture, now I can step into the spotlight, right? And they saw it as a chance for personal advancement, selfish ambition. Oh, Paul can't teach that Bible study anymore? Oh my gosh, well, you know what's weird? I was praying the other day and God opened up that space for me and was just kind of confirming through me my incredibleness. And so I guess I'll take it. And like these people began to do it for Jesus, but really for themselves. And Paul looks at it. And what does Paul do as he sits in prison and watch people kind of trade off of his name like that? What does he do? He says, what then? That's Greek for, I don't care. He says, the name of Jesus is going out, and my whole life is the name of Jesus, so I'm happy. When I have a God-given purpose, he says, God has ordained me to be in this prison cell. I'm happy, and I trust God with that. And if his ministry is flourishing right now, is it a ministry about Jesus? Awesome. And you see, Paul's not shaken by the success of other people, and I love that. I love that. Insecure churches say, we want the name of Jesus to be made great exclusively through us. But God doesn't write exclusive contracts like that. Healthy churches say we want the name of Jesus to be made great. And we want it made great here and at Champions Forest and at any other church in this area that will celebrate Jesus because he's the team we're on. Two of the biggest churches in Dallas, Texas, Watermark and the Village Church. And the pastor of Watermark tweeted out a little link the other day. And the link was entitled, What I Really Think of the Village Church. Ooh. So everybody down, uh, clicked on it, right? And it was the pastor of Watermark talking about the church, the village. And he said, that church celebrates the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I love them. And then he just went on about a three to five minute celebration of how amazing this church is at celebrating the name of Jesus and how deeply it satisfies him because that's what his life's about. When my life is about Jesus and I see you celebrate Jesus, you're not a threat, you're not an enemy, you're a friend and we rejoice together. When I embrace a God-given purpose, people's success isn't a threat to me. It's a cause for rejoicing. What about the weight of your desires? The weight of your desires. If I create my own purposes, created purposes can't hold the freight of our desires. And we see this all the time. Famously, the movie Chariots of Fire covered the 1924 Olympics in France, and it shows you two guys, Harold Abrams and Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell, a devout Christian. And when asked why he was running in the Olympics, he said, because God made me fast. He said, and when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Right? <laughs> and then you had Harold Abrams, who wasn't a Christian. And Harold Abrams said, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. And even then, I'm not sure I will. He said, this is all I have. And even if I get it, I know that the crowd disappears and I don't think it'll be enough to fill my heart. Even before the race he sees, it's not enough. If I create this purpose for myself, it can't handle the intensity of human desire. It can't. This is what shakes us when famous people do this all the time. People that have arrived at the pinnacle of whatever they were climbing and see it's not enough. And you see it, Boris Becker, when he won Wimbledon came out and told people his struggle with depression and wanting to kill himself. People are like, you won Wimbledon, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Jack Higgins wrote 60 novels, all 60 bestsellers. How many novelists would love to be that guy? 
And he was asked in an interview what's something he wished he would have known as a boy. And this is what he said. I wish I knew that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. And you see so many people take all their desires and point it at a created purpose. And when they've achieved it, they're just as empty as when they started and it terrifies them. No created purpose can handle the weight of human desire. It can't. It's not designed to. And yet here you see Paul writing. And Paul enters into a real difficulty for him. He says, I'm in prison and they might kill me. Or they might let me live. And he looks at it and he says, if I die, it's gain. Because I get Jesus. And I love him and I'm about him. He says, but if I live... It's because I get to serve you guys. He says, it's fruitful labor. And he said, as I do fruitful labor, I help you progress in your joy in the faith. And he looks at it and he goes, I don't know which to choose. They're both great options. But Paul looks and says, you know what? It looks like I'm gonna live. That's great. He says, because my whole life is to live as Christ. And you go, what does that mean to live as Christ? Does that mean he just reads his Bible all day? He says, no, to live is Christ. And what does that mean? It means that I pour my life into you and I help you progress in trusting God and progress in enjoying God. And you see all through this letter, even in prison, the most often repeated word is joy. It thrills the human heart through life to live for Christ, for your progress in joy. And then when I die, even that is gain. Paul looks and his, the gospel of Jesus can hold the freight of Paul's life and his desires. It makes a difference in the well-being of other people. The well-being of other people. Because embracing a God-given purpose for my life anchors a sense of morality. This deserves a whole sermon and it won't get one. But if you create your own purpose for life, I'm just living to make me happy, I'm doing me, I'm going for my own, you can be good to other people, but that philosophy gives you no basis for it. You're just living better than your philosophy deserves. Bertrand Russell, the famed philosopher, said it this way, that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of an accidental collocation of atoms. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual's life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. The whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation be safely built. He says, all your fire, all your belief, all your love, he says, it's nothing. It's an accidental collocation of atoms that will be buried under the debris of a dead universe. He says, when you create your own purpose, your purpose means nothing. Because if there's no created design, there's no big reason for it all, then you can create a reason but it's not real and it won't last and it's not worth anything. And so no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, it all burns up in the death of the universe. So help a grandma across the street, run her over. It doesn't matter. <laughs> be a benevolent king or be a dictator. It doesn't matter. That is where this philosophy ultimately leads. If there's no reason for it all, then all that's left is for me to eat drink and be merry until I die. And whether I'm nice to you or not makes no difference at all because you don't matter, I don't matter, none of this matters, so I go for mine and who cares what happens to you? That's where this philosophy goes. It usually ends in abusive sex and violence if you read human history. It's a devastating road when I create my own purposes. It makes us selfish people and selfish people don't live long. But when I embrace a God-given design, what is the greatest commandment Jesus was asked? He couldn't separate him. He said to love God and to love people. That when I embrace God's design for me, he always points my eyes at others. Paul said to live is Christ 
And you go, what does that mean, Paul? It means that my whole life is a labor for your progress and joy in the faith. The way to live for Christ is to help you enjoy trusting Christ more. It becomes an anchor for morality because God-given designs always work out for the benefit of people, for society. That if I embrace his design for my life, it anchors my morality. I have a reason to love you, even if you're my enemy. And last, the inevitability of death. The inevitability of death. If I create my own purposes, then all that I've done disappears at death. Death is the great end of all of it. My love ends. My purposes end. What I've built falls. Death steals everything. It terminates my reason for existing. It won't endure. Paul looks at his life and he says, to live is Christ and death gain because I get Christ. He says, the purposes I'm chasing for my life go bursting past death into forever. That I get to proclaim the name of Jesus till I see Jesus. I get to encourage you to progress in your faith until your faith becomes sight. I get purposes that endure forever. And what are they? The loving embrace of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's Paul's purposes and it endures beyond death. Do you see it? What you see in Paul is great chess. I, I don't know if you're a chess player. If you are, then you probably know what went down in New York uh, several weeks ago. Several weeks ago before an elite crowd, there gathered 23-year-old Magnus Carlsen, who's the current chess world champion, and he played against Gary Kasparov, the 51-year-old former champion, considered by many to be the best to ever play the game. It was a huge moment in the universe of chess. One person was asked, why is this meeting so great? And he said, it's not often you get the Michael Jordan and LeBron James of chess in the same room. Which I think it's interesting he chose those names because you wonder if anyone else is saying, it's not often you get the Magnuson and the Kasparov of quilting in the same room. You know, like who says that about the chess players? But it's a big deal that the two greatest chess players currently and possibly of all time faced off in New York, right? One person in the crowd was asked to describe the event and he called it life fulfilling. <laughs> I'll leave that. But <laughs> if you don't play chess, let me just say this. What's the goal of chess? Uh, the goal of chess is, is to maneuver your pieces in such a way that no matter what the other guy does, he can't win and you can't lose. He said, it's to position myself on the board in such a way that he can't win and I can't lose. That's what it's called to be in checkmate. I got you in checkmate. Nothing you can do can harm me. Nothing you can do can change the fact that I win. I got you in checkmate. You read Philippians chapter one, Paul is ecstatic with joy even in prison. Why? Because as someone who's embraced God's purposes for his life, he's got the world in checkmate. He's got the world in checkmate. Paul, you wanna spread the gospel? We're gonna put you in prison. No problem, prison ministry. Paul, we're gonna get people to slander you, talk bad about you. Are they spreading the gospel while they're doing it? Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Paul, we're gonna kill you. Great, to die is gain, I get to see Jesus. Okay, we're not going to kill you. Great, because that means fruitful labor, and I'll just keep talking about Jesus, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they realize the things we fear the most, loss of freedom, slander of our name, and death. Don't shake Paul. There is nothing you can do to hurt him. He's got the world in checkmate. Why? Because he's linked up with the one who rules the world. When I embrace God's purposes for me, I reach my highest potential. I feel the greatest joy. I become unshakable, right? This road leads to nothing. It really does. This road leads to life that races on into eternity, and that's the road I want for you. It's a fascinating people who live like this, that no matter what their circumstances are, they can't shake you. John Wesley, when Wesley went to go be a missionary to America, first time he went, he got on a boat, and on that boat, he was a missionary who was not a Christian, chaplain of the boat. And when a storm hit, broke the mainsail, 
he did what all the Englishmen on the boat did at that moment. Freaked out, went bananas, we're gonna die, right? But he looked over and there was a little group of Moravians that even when the whole world was chaos, they sang, they sang from their heart and they were peaceful in the midst of the chaos. He said, even their children. And he came to them and said, how did you do that? How did you have joy and peace serving other people, singing to God, even as your circumstances look to collapse? And they looked at him and asked him, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior? And he said, I hope so. And they said, no, no, no. Do you know? Have you come to trust him to save you? Jesus Christ came to live the perfect life you could not, died the death you deserved, so that as I reach out empty hands of faith, he brings me into his family, and he who began a good work in you, Philippians says, will be faithful to complete it. I'm secure in my king. I've embraced him, he's embraced me, and my life is his until forever and forever. That stabilizes you, and it makes you a wonder to those around you. And John Wesley came to Christ at seeing the beauty of the stability of a life that's embraced its God-given design. And that's my hope for you and for me. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you that God, wherever we are in life, most of us know that, that what we deeply long for is love, connection. And when you were asked, what's the greatest commandment? Why are we here? What does God want? You said it's to love me. We long for a love that's eternal and unshakable. And you say the reason you're here is to love God, the eternal and unshakable one. And so God, I pray for any in this room that maybe they thought religion was just tack on to your pursuit of happiness, some moral imperatives. I just pray they'd realize that's not what you're looking for. That you made us. And as Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And some of us, our whole life has been a restlessness and it's time to come home. I pray for those who don't know you that they could throw open the empty hands of faith and say, Jesus, I want you to forgive me, to heal me, to adopt me, to bring me into the family, and I want my life and my gifts, be they in architecture, hospitality, engineering, whatever, I want my life and my gifts to be used for your glory and the good of those around you. I wanna embrace God's design for my life. That's when I reach my potential as a man or a woman. That's where I find my greatest joy in him. I pray for those who don't know you, they could cry out for that today. And for those of us who know you, God, I pray we wouldn't check the box, yes, I'm a Christian, and then pursue the vain and empty path of just trying to do whatever we think will make us happy. Open our eyes that we can see my greatest potential, highest good is embracing your purposes for my life. May we study your word, gather with your people, and use our gifts for your glory and the good of those around us until the day we see you. May that be our story, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Ben Stewart, uh, who just did part three of Philippians. We took a look at the world in Checkmate. Yes. And so what you're talking about is what God created you for, finding your purpose. Yeah. And yeah. so there's questions that came in about that. Um, sure. And um, generally around two questions around the same thing, but I understand that I'm here to fulfill God's design for my life, yeah. um, but how do I know what it is? And the same person asked, how does a young adult find their purpose? So right. how do we find, how, or how do we begin to find out what our purpose is? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, um, I think what they might be coming at with that is you can give it different names, but sometimes theologians will talk about God's revealed will and his secret will, okay. you know, uh, his revealed will is the Bible, the word of God, the, the word he chose to give us for life and godliness. Mm -hmm. The secret will is, should I move to Dallas or Houston? Right. Should I be an engineer or an astronaut? Mm -hmm. And they call it secret because when it comes to circumstantial stuff like that, often he won't tell us. 
he just won't. And you can ask him and he's not going to tell you because he wants you to use wisdom. That's why he wrote the book of Proverbs. Here's, here's how to function um, in life and navigate relationships and navigate business. And so what I would stress for the young person is not to obsess about what God's secret will. If, like, if, if he would just tell me if I'm supposed to be an architect for Jesus, I would be it. They go, no, he's told you uh, how to be someone who loves God. And so press into that. I tell young people that all the time, excel at the revealed things that God has revealed in his word. I'm meant to know him, right? Paul will talk in Philippians about progressively knowing him and chasing it like a runner chases the finish line. So I would say do that. Prioritize time in the word of God with the people of God, knowing God. And as you do that, he tends to change your heart, right? And the perspective of your heart. And that changes your priorities and your practice, as a friend of mine says. That will work out into your life. And as you're doing that, you discover what you're good at. I mean, for me, I was like, my job is to pursue the Lord. And as I did it, I realized, and I'm horrible at math. So I want to be the best math student I can be, but that'll always be about a three on the scale, you know? So I, he probably didn't make me to be, a, to be an accountant. And so that's what I mean. Pursue the revealed will. And as you do that, you stay attentive to how did he wire me and how am I best used to serve the people of God for the glory of God. And so that's obviously, uh, there should be whole books dedicated to that. There are whole books dedicated to that, but um, that's maybe the short answer. Okay, great. Okay, so in there, you asked a question, what if, what, what's the one thing that if I took away, it would remove your existence yeah. or take away the meaning of your life? And for me, and for the person who read the question in, my children immediately came to my mind. Right. So what if the children, what are the meaning of your existence? If they're taking away, um, this person saying, I'm not sure if I could recover. God blesses us with our children, but we have a difficult time not placing them as number one in our lives. Yeah. It's, I totally relate to that. Cause the first thing I think about is my kids, you know, <laughs> and nothing stresses me out more. I'll have moments of panic sometimes where I'll think about some harm coming to them in a way that I can't control and I want to control it, you know, but ultimately the best thing for my kid is for me to trust God with my life and walk with God and then trust God with their life because he, he rules it anyway. But I think if I say, no, I'm going to make my kid my source of meaning and significant in my life, a kid can't support that weight of the sense of value of a mom. Like that's a scary thing to put on a kid and they'll feel that. Mm -hmm. um, like my mom spouse. isn't a success in life unless mm -hmm. I perform these things. That's an enormous stress to put on a child's life. But if I pursue the Lord, then I'm free to parent the child and go, my job is to bring them up in the instruction of the Lord and to trust them with the Lord and, uh, uh, and trust the Lord with them. And, and as I do that, I can function and they can function. But if I put on them the weight of my reason for existing, that's too much. But if the Lord took away my children, would I be devastated? Yes. I mean, the grieving would be unbelievable. And, and that's not disobedient to the Lord. We can weep bitterly, but at the end of the day, even with my face in the dirt, we're meant to say what Job did. If the Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What he meant by that is not, I think it's great. My kids died. It's at the end of the day, it's Lord, I trust you. Mm -hmm. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my kids. I trust you. And that's what we always have to come back to. Do I trust the Lord or not with my kids? Ultimately, there's no safer hands to put our kids in. And so I always return there, but I understand the difficulty of that. Great. Okay. And so then we had one other question come in. Um, you did mention St. Augustine briefly in yep. um, your message today. And so there's a question. St. Augustine is a prime role model for many, and he's mentioned often. Um, love to hear more about how he transformed his addiction to serve the Lord. Um, specifically, so much energy is wasted on sexual addiction and porn. Um, could you give us a little more insight into that? Yeah, well, um, he's a fascinating person to study. You can buy the Confessions of St. Augustine are, is a famous book. You can buy it. I think you can even probably get it for free on Amazon. It's one of those kind of classics that sometimes come up for like a dollar or something. Much of the book is dedicated to his wrestling with a cult that he joined called Manichaeanism. 
I don't think you'd want to read all of that. It's pretty mind-numbingly boring. But you can read his conversion story, and it's pretty powerful. So I would tell them, pick up the Confessions of St. Augustine. You can do that. Um, There's also um, John Piper did a series of books where he did little mini biographies of different people in church history. And he did one on St. Augustine. And I would recommend that, especially if you're saying, how do I... Uh, if the grip of sexual addiction is in my life. Augustine, reading his confessions will tell you his story, Mm -hmm. but if you want to go a step deeper, Piper's book I think is really helpful. And then there's a host of great resources on dealing with St. Augustine that are, I mean dealing with sex addiction that are not connected to his life. And I would say probably the simplest thing to say now would be to um, plug into the church that has resources for that. There's recovery options here that if that's an issue, just reading a book is not going to solve it. You're going to need community around you. And so I would plug into the recovery options here at the church. Okay, great. Well, yeah. and thank you for being back again today. Um, we always, we're talking to, love to hear the stories of Breakaway and what God's yeah. doing there. And that's where um, we'll be. Yeah, so um, you'll be back with us again before the end of the year. That's true. Um, but you'll be back in College Station for a few weeks at least before yeah. you come back. Um, yeah. So uh, join us back here next week for Postscript as we start Wisdom for Life. Thank you for your questions and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.